Welcome to Emmanuel Church Glenhaven Bible Talks. Our church loves to engage with God's written word, the Bible, as we gather week by week. If you missed a sermon or want to hear it again, we pray that your time here today will refresh and renew you as you follow Jesus. Today we continue our series of sermons called Holiness and the Heart of God, studies in the Ten Commandments. We come now to the second commandment, you shall not make an idol. Most Christians assume this is an easy one to keep. They're just not tempted to make a little statue and bow down to it. In this talk, Hayden Smith shows that there's a lot more to idolatry than physical images. An idol is not so much a statue we hold in our hands, but something we hold in our hearts. And we're more vulnerable to idolatry than we ever thought. Hayden gives us five reasons why idolatry is a bad idea and encourages us to learn from God's word what God is like so that our love for him might grow. But before we hear from Hayden, let's listen to the Bible. The passages are Exodus chapter 20 verses 1 to 6 and Isaiah chapter 44 verses 6 to 20. From Exodus 20. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. From Isaiah chapter 44. This is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last, Apart from me, there is no God. Who then is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and lay out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people. And what is yet to come? Yes, let them foretell what will come. Do not tremble. Do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. All who make idols are nothing, and the things they treasure are worthless. Those who would speak up for them are blind. They're ignorant to their own shame. Who shapes a god and casts an idol which can profit nothing? People who do that will be put to shame. Such craftsmen are only human beings. Let them all come together and take their stand. They will be brought down to terror and shame. The blacksmith takes a tool and works with it in the coals. He shapes an idol with hammers. He forges it with the might of his arm. He gets hungry and loses his strength. He drinks no water and grows faint. The carpenter measures with a line and makes an outline with a marker. He roughs it out with chisels and marks it with compasses. He shapes it in human form, human form in all its glory, that it may dwell in a shrine. He cut down cedars or perhaps took a cypress or oak. He let it grow among the trees of the forest or planted a pine and the rain made it grow. It is used as fuel for burning. Some of it he takes and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. But he also fashions a god and worships it. He makes an idol and bows down to it. Half of the wood he burns in the fire. Over it he prepares his meal, he roasts his meat and eats his fill. He also warms himself and says, Ah, I'm warm, I see the fire. 
From the rest, he makes a god, his idol. He bows down to it and worships. He prays to it and says, Save me, you are my god. They know nothing. They understand nothing. Their eyes are plastered over so they cannot see, and their minds closed so they cannot understand. No one stops to think. No one has the knowledge or understanding to say, half of it I used for fuel, I even baked bread over its coals, I roasted meat and I ate. Shall I make a detestable thing from what is left? Shall I bow down to a block of wood? Such a person feeds on ashes. A deluded heart misleads him. He cannot save himself or say, Is not this thing in my right hand a lie? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now, here's Hayden. Exodus 20 verse 3 reads as follows. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. After last week's sermon on the first commandment, my eldest child said to me, are you preaching on idols this weekend? Because look, you can buy as many as you like from Aldi this weekend only. And lo and behold, for nineteen ninety nine, from next Saturday, you can buy a meditating frog, a tortoise or a Buddha for your garden. Now, truth be told, I think probably this says more about Aldi than it does about authentic Buddhism. But I think when many of us think of idolatry, we naturally think of statues just like these ones that are for sale. And so we go, well, that's not too difficult, that is it. We just won't buy statues and we are in no danger of failing to keep the second commandment. But idolatry is not simply a matter of something made with the hands, it's a matter of the heart. So in Ezekiel chapter 14 verse 3, God speaks to the prophet and says this, Son of man, which just means human being, these men have set up idols, where? In their hearts. You see, idols live in the heart because human beings are made for worship. And not just religious people, but all people are made to worship. As the influential author and postmodern academic David Foster Wallace, he writes the following. Because here's something else that's true. In the day-to-day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There's no such thing as not worshipping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. The insidious thing about these forms of worship is that they are unconscious. They are default settings. They're the kind of worship you just gradually slip into day after day without ever being fully aware that that's what you're doing. So if we're all worshipping, that means we all are in danger of worshipping the wrong thing, worshipping idols. And that helps us to understand, well, what do we mean by idolatry? Christian author and pastor Tim Keller explains idolatry in the following way. He said, what is an idol? It is anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything you seek to give you what only God can give. Anything that can serve, he says, as a counterfeit God. Especially the very best things in life. Did you notice that? It's not just things that are wrong, but things that we love in the wrong order. Things that we love more than God. In the spirit of the Olympics, it's those things that vie with God for the gold medal place in our lives. Keller goes on to explain it can be family and children, or career and making money, or achievement and critical acclaim, or saving face, that is, honour, as well as social standing. It can be a romantic relationship, peer approval, competence and skill, secure and comfortable circumstances, your beauty or your brains a great political or social cause, your morality and virtue, or even success in the Christian ministry. These things are good, but when they become the most important thing in our lives, they are no longer goals, they have become gods. As you think about what are the priorities in your life, I wonder, what is it that your habits reveal about your heart? What do you daydream about? What do you worry about? What do you Google? What's on your social media feed or what YouTube videos do you obsess over? What does your bank account show about your spending habits? What about your calendar and diary? What does your language say about what matters to you, the friends that you choose? 
And as you consider all these things, you'll see that every life has certain goals, including yours. And we need to be careful that those goals do not become gods in our life. As we look at Exodus and Deuteronomy, and in fact the broad sweep of Scripture today, we'll see five reasons why idolatry is a bad idea. Firstly, God will not share his glory. Secondly, no sculpture can contain God. Thirdly, idolatry shapes us and not in a good way. Fourthly, idolatry enslaves us. And fifthly, idolatry does not satisfy our deepest desires. Let's jump in with Exodus 20 verse 5. You shall not bow down to them, that is, foreign gods, or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And from Deuteronomy 6, 14 and 11, 16. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the people around you. Be careful or you will be enticed to turn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. I heard this story from a friend of mine a few years ago. It was about the 1999 Rugby League final between the St George Dragons and the Melbourne Storm. He recalls one fan who'd clearly got the ticket in the wrong section because there he was, a lone St George fan, in the middle of a sea of purple Storm fans. One red and white jersey besieged by an army of Melburnians. While St George had led the game throughout and uh, this fan, this kid from Cogra as it were, was loving life because his team was winning. But right at the end, Melbourne Storm came back into it. A cross field kick from Brett Camorley with four minutes to go. And the ball appears to have been knocked on, but the video ref looked at it again, ruled that it was actually an illegal high tackle, which means the try was awarded. The Melbourne Storm had won, and it seems as though 80,000 of the Melbourne faithful were giving it to this one St George fan. And he then took off his St George Illawarra jersey, not in disgust, not in self-preservation, but to reveal underneath it, of all things, a Melbourne Storm jersey. And he started celebrating with other fans because it seems that his team had won. This is what we used to call in old money, having a bob each way. It is not right to change your allegiance or to have dual allegiances when it comes to sport. And similarly, well, how much more so when it comes to God? You see, we are not to have God as our favourite. God is our sole object of worship because he alone is God, as we discussed last week with the first commandment. To describe God as my favourite God is a category error akin to describing Libby as my favourite wife. She is my only wife, and God is the only creator. All else is part of that creation or a corruption thereof. This is why God will not share his glory with another. He demands total loyalty. He has no tolerance for those, as it were, who will change their spiritual team. Here, in the context of Deuteronomy, God's people, Israel, are about to enter into a foreign land where they will be tempted to worship foreign gods. God says, pick a team. He says, do not change your spiritual jersey. I am a jealous God. Worship me only. Now, let me distinguish here between envy and jealousy. Envy is always bad. It means desiring or being resentful of something that belongs to somebody else. But jealousy, in the right circumstances, can be good if it's being protective of something that rightfully belongs to you. So, for example, if I go outside and I see my neighbours driving a fancy new car and I'm overcome by the unfairness of life, I'm frustrated at them, I think ill of them, I begin to curse them in my mind and curse others. Why can't I have a nice car? That's not good. But if I go outside and see my neighbour breaking into my car and stealing it and driving it down the street... Well, I'm allowed to feel a little, a little defensive, a little territorial. This is my car. You can't have it, at least with, not without asking. This is a healthy jealousy. You see, if God is truly God, he will tolerate no idol, no rival gods. And for sins such as these, as discussed in Exodus 20, God will act in judgment. To paraphrase 1 Kings 18 verse 21, God asks, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, then follow him. But if another God is God, then follow them. Firstly, God will not share his glory with another. Secondly, idolatry is a bad idea because no sculpture can capture God. Exodus 32 speaks to this, verses 1, 3 and 4. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. So all the people took off their earrings, brought them to Aaron. He took them what they handed him and made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up 
out of Egypt. Now it's important to note what is being said here when the idol is presented. These are your gods who did what? Who brought you up out of Egypt. This is not an attempt to produce a rival god, but to give a representation to the god who brought them up out of Egypt. In effect, they're saying all the other countries, all the other nations have a proper God that they can touch, that they can see, a physical representation of their deity. So why can't we have a proper God? Perhaps this will help. Some of you would know Cristiano Ronaldo, one of the most talented footballers in the world, one of the best paid and, so I'm told, one of the most handsome. So in 2018, the Portuguese International Airport decided to honour its favourite son by commissioning a statue of Ronaldo. This is the statue that was unveiled before the press, the adoring fans, and crucially, before Ronaldo himself. It's not a great statue, is it? Granted, it's not as bad as this one of David Beckham, but still, neither are great. But the point is, before I start criticising someone else's sculpture, I need to recognise it's not easy. It's not easy to capture the likeness of a person in bronze. How much harder is it to capture the likeness of God? especially since God, as the scriptures teach us, is not a physical being. He is, according to John 4, 24, spirit. In 1 Timothy 1, 17, he's invisible. Psalm 147, verse 5 says this, his understanding is beyond measure. What kind of foolhardy sculptor would think, yeah, I'll give that a go. How hard can that be to capture God's likeness? Sure, such attempts might be well-intentioned, We were only trying to capture a sense of what God is like. But God is clear. No image can contain his glory, and any attempt to do so is an insult. But again, the shaping of metal is not the most important bit. It's the shaping of the heart. J.I. Packer, who is one of the most influential and one of my favourite theologians, he observes the Second Commandment's teaching in this way. He says, God is not the sort of person that we are. We cannot possibly guess our way to God's attributes by intuition or infer them by analogy from our own notion of what ideal humanity might look like. We cannot know him unless he speaks and tells us about himself. Thus it appears the positive force of the second commandment, that is the flip side of the second commandment, is that it compels us to take our thoughts of God from his holy word and from no other source whatsoever, including our imaginations. There will be things about God that will surprise us. As you read the Bible, there will be things that will confuse you. As you understand God's character and actions, there will be things that will offend you. And when he does, we are not at liberty to give God a public relations makeover, to smooth out his rough edges, to omit the bits that are most problematic. Like any relationship with a real person, there will be things that you and God will disagree with. This is healthy, and you've got to wrestle these things through. If a newlywed couple says to you, we're so in love, we never disagree about anything, what would you say? I'd say, someone is lying. In fact, if you and God agree on everything, be very careful. As Pastor Tim Keller observes, if your God never disagrees with you, it's possible you might just be worshipping an idealised version of yourself. Because God alone is worthy, we must worship him and no other God, and nor must we reshape him according to our ideals about what we think a God ought to be. This is idolatry. God will not share his glory. No sculpture can capture God's glory. And idolatry shapes us. And not in a good way. Uh, My eldest children have just discovered Timu, which is all the cheapest, most random things on the internet. Uh, It's essentially landfill with free shipping. And one of the things you can get on there, I discovered, is ice cube trays. I went through 10 pages of different ice cube trays. Every ice cube tray imaginable. You can shape ice cubes in the following shapes. Diamonds, penguins, hexagons, cylinders, Daleks, skulls, Labradors, you name it, you can get it. But this sense of an ice cube mould is perhaps a helpful image because when God creates us, he moulds us to be like him, to share his shape, to be made in his image as discussed in the first chapters of Genesis. Psalm 115 particularly verse 8, describes a profound insight into how worship shapes us to be like the thing we're worshipping. And if one worships an idol, you become like it. It says this, Those who make idols will become like them. It's the same for all who trust in them. You see, when we worship something else, we choose a different mould, and we begin to be moulded in that likeness. 
In Romans 8.29, it says that we are to be conformed or moulded to the likeness of Jesus. Yet sadly, too often we are, Romans 12 verse 2, conformed or moulded to the pattern of this world. Bishop Tom Wright describes this phenomenon in the following way. When human beings give their heartfelt allegiance to and worship that which is not God, they progressively cease to reflect the image of God. One of the primary laws of human life is that you become like what you worship. Those who worship money increasingly define themselves in terms of it and increasingly treat others as creditors, debtors, partners or customers rather than human beings. Those who worship sex define themselves in terms of it, their preferences, their practices, their past histories and increasingly treat other people as actual or potential sex objects. Those who worship power define themselves in terms of it and treat other people as either collaborators, competitors or pawns. As you think about what you worship, how are those things shaping your life? Because if it is not in the likeness of God who is love, then you are being shaped and not for the better. Idolatry also enslaves people. Now, some of you would know the character Gollum and his ring, which is the ring of power from Lord of the Rings. Well, Gollum's ring provides a very helpful example of what we're talking about here of idolatry enslaving people. Because the things that our hearts long for can actually take hold of us. Tolkien explains this phenomenon as following. Frodo, who is the main protagonist, and Gandalf, who is a wise wizard, this is their conversation. Frodo says, you say the ring is dangerous. In what way? In many ways, answered the wizard. It is far more powerful than I ever dared to think of at first. So powerful that in the end it would utterly overcome anyone of mortal race. Those who possessed it, it would possess them. It's not the person who possesses the ring. It is the ring who possesses the person. You see, in Exodus 22, verse 33, we read the following. If you serve their God, that is the idols of other nations, it will surely be a snare to you, a trap that captures people and they are unable to escape from. This is explored further in Galatians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, where St. Paul says, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves. To whom? To those who by nature are not gods, that is to idols. He asks, do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? These idols use our desires against us. Who is in charge at this point? Is it us who wants to worship these other things? Is it us who wants to make other priorities the goal and God of our life? Or are we merely subject to idols who are exercising power over us? Let me ask you a question. If in your heart you know the things you are doing are not consistent with your profession as a Christian, with your own values, then there is a danger that actually this idol is exercising control over you. If you are compromising on your principles, if you are not honouring commitments that you have made, if the choices you are making are causing harm to others, it is time to Seek the help of the Holy Spirit in taking charge of your life again, taking that goal, that God, and bringing it down the pecking order, taking that priority and saying, that's not number one in my life, let's put it back in its place. Because otherwise, as we think of Gollum, once called Smeagol in the ring, the consequences of him being controlled are tragic. He becomes friendless, homeless, and willing to do anything even to kill his own friend, to have the ring. He acts under compulsion, yes, but also by his own choice. He is a victim of the ring, but he is also a willing volunteer. And Tolkien describes this life of chosen slavery through the wizard when he says, Gollum hated the ring and loved it, just as he hated himself and loved himself. Let's not be Gollum. And lastly, idols do not satisfy us. Perhaps most tragic of all, Idols promise the world, but they do not satisfy. In Isaiah 44, a chapter all about the foolishness of idolatry, we read in verse 17, He, that is the person fashioning an idol, makes a god his idol. He bows down to it and worships it. He prays to it and says, Save me, you are my god. This is a petition to that god, but also an effective promise from that so-called god. I will save you. To paraphrase uh, Luke 4 and Matthew 4, if you will only bow down and worship me, all the kingdoms of the earth will be yours. 
But such gods, according to Isaiah 44, have no mouth to speak, have no ears to hear, have no hands to enact anything. And so they cannot deliver on what they have promised. This implicit promise, you will be happy if you worship me. But as we get to verse 20, we realize that's not the case. He, that is the idolater, feeds on ashes. It's a description of a life of suffering, of lament, of loss. But even here, he will not admit that this idol has failed him. He holds it in his right hand, but we read this. A deceived heart has turned him aside, and he cannot deliver himself, but nor is he willing to admit, is there not a lie in my right hand? Author David Foster Wallace went on to discuss the failure of false worship. He said, again, only from his own purely secular experience, he says this, if you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. Never feel you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your body and beauty and sexual allure and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. Worship power, you will end up feeling weak and afraid. And you will need ever more power over others to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, and you will end up feeling stupid a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. This worship, as David Foster Wallace calls it, does not satisfy our soul. Rather, we live with perpetual achievement anxiety. It is never enough. And so we hold on to these things more tightly. We grasp hold of these things, hoping that if we sacrifice more, if we seize more, then finally we'll be satisfied. But it's not the case. I remember when the children were younger, we went to an urban farm in Melbourne City. There were pigs and chickens and cows. But the most harrowing experience of all was when the toddlers and preschoolers sat in a circle and the zookeepers handed out guinea pigs for the children to hold. And you could tell all the parents in unison instructing their child, usually in vain, do not squeeze the guinea pig. Gentle hands, gentle hands. When something, whether financial security or relationship or health or beauty or travel or success or whatever goal tugs at your heartstrings, whenever these things vie for first place in our life, we grasp it as tightly as we can. But like a guinea pig with a toddler, if you hold it too tight, it doesn't end well. In fact, you end up harming the thing that you love all too much. And this is the thing with holding on to good things. We lose perspective. No spouse... No career, no holiday, no amount of work in the gym, no ministry, no acts of service for parents or children. None of these things can substitute for God as the center of your life. And if you put them in the center of your life, there is too much pressure on those things. You hold them too tightly and it doesn't end well. In fact, you end up harming your career or your spouse or whatever the thing is that you happen to love all too much. Rather, we need to recognize these good things that we have. They are not gods to be worshipped, but they are gifts from God and are to be used for his glory. Five things. God does not share his glory. No sculpture can capture God. Idolatry shapes us and not in good ways. Idolatry enslaves us and no idol can truly satisfy us. So if idolatry is a problem, surely the answer is we must have less worship of idols. But actually the answer is not less worship, but more. We must not merely chastise ourselves for loving the wrong things. Rather, we must cultivate our love for the Lord. The key to observing the second commandment is to commit ourselves to fulfilling the first commandment. If we love God first, then we will order our loves correctly. If we spend time with Jesus and see that he alone is the one who is worthy of our worship. As we come to the person of Jesus, you will more and more see your life being lived in praise of him. The second commandment is fundamentally about getting the order of things right. Love God first and love our neighbour as ourselves. When it comes to the zoo, squeeze your parents as tightly as you like. They're the ones you brought to the zoo. But the guinea pig hold gently. In the same way, let us love God but hold all other gifts with an open hand. For they are not good gods, but rather gifts to be received with thanksgiving. 1 John 5.21 says the following, Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Thanks for listening. 
We trust today's message encouraged you as you follow Jesus. For more information about Emmanuel Church, please visit our website, glenhaven.church. Until next time, bye for now.